we can begin, I think, if it would be easy. Okay, great. So, <clears throat> hi, everyone. Um, welcome to this first session after the summer break. Uh, I'm very happy to introduce Yves Bennett, um, who is a member of the Institute of Recherche, Media, Culture, Communication et Numérique at the University of uh, Sorbonne Nouvelle in Paris. Um, her research mainly focuses on representations of gender in science fiction television series. And she has published a monograph based on her PhD thesis, Gender in Post-9-11 American Apocalyptic TV, um, and in many journals such as uh, Quarterly Review of Film and Video, Journal of Popular Television, and Science Fiction Film and Television. Uh, so today she'll be approaching a very interesting topic of uh, radicalization and gender representations in the media. And without much further ado, Eva, uh, I'll let you do your presentation. Thank you so much, uh, Lenka, for the introduction. Thanks again for having me. Um, so I thought I'd start off just by telling you um, a bit more about my research in general, although um, Alenka kind of already told you a bit. So yeah, um, it mostly focuses on um, generally North American science fiction television, um, particularly in relation to, um, on the one hand, gender and feminism, uh, and then on the other, um, representations of terrorism, security, uh, and conspiracy. Um, so uh, my um, PhD thesis uh, brought together these two strands. Uh, as Alenka said, it was on um, gender in post 9-11 American apocalyptic television. Um, and yeah, I turned it into a, a book um, with Bloomsbury, which came out in 2019. Um, in terms of my methodology, it's mainly um, close reading, textual analysis in the kind of film studies tradition. Um, so looking at themes, stylistic elements, narrative structure. Um, but I would say I have a kind of cultural studies-ish approach um, in that uh, despite my close attention to the text, so the TV shows themselves, um, I also try not to lose sight of um, contextual factors. And uh, by that, I mean not only the um, program's socio-political contexts, um, but their conditions of um, production and reception uh, and the way that these might have impacted uh, apparently creative decisions. So uh, the piece of work that I'm going to talk to you about today uh, is an article um, that is currently uh, in press at uh, the new review of film and television studies. Um, but I think they must have a huge backlog of um, articles waiting to be published because apparently it won't be out until uh, next year at the earliest and uh, probably the year after. Um, it started life as a conference paper way back in 2016, uh, but the theme has remained topical, as you'll see. So uh, at the time I started my research, uh, the jihadi group variously known as ISIL, Islamic State, ISIS and Daesh uh, was at the height of its power. Um, although mainly based in Iraq and Syria, ISIL recruited a large proportion of its members, perhaps as many as half uh, from abroad. And in the English language uh, media of the global north, there was a particular preoccupation um, with women who left their home countries to join the group, um, who became known as jihadi brides. Um, for instance, there was a high profile case in the UK, where I'm from, uh, of three 15 year old schoolgirls from the Bethnal Green area of London, uh, who uh, ran away to Syria to marry ISIL fighters in uh, 2015, after being groomed online. Um, ISIL had been all but defeated by 2017, although there actually have been recently some signs of a resurgence, but jihadi brides have remained in international headlines due to the recent efforts of um, several Western women who joined ISIL, 
uh, including one of the Bethnal Green uh, trio, Shamima Begum, uh, to return to their countries of birth. In uh, 2019, Begum was stripped of her British citizenship. Um, and in 2021, the Supreme Court ruled against allowing her to return to the UK to contest this decision. She's one of the more kind of heavily mediatized cases. Um, but as you may know, there are actually thousands of uh, former jihadi brides uh, of about 60 different nationalities um, currently living along with their children uh, in harsh conditions in refugee camps and mostly being refused repatriation by their home countries. Um, although just recently, the US, France and Germany have uh, repa repatriated some uh, women and children from the camps. I'll be coming back to uh, Shamima Begum and the other jihadi brides from time to time. Um, but first, let me introduce the TV show that I focus on in the article, um, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. It was the first TV show to form part of the huge multimedia franchise, um, the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Nowadays, there are dozens of MCU shows, uh, but uh, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. was the first. It premiered in uh, 2013 uh, on the ABC network in the US uh, and ran for seven seasons until 2020. Um, I was looking at this show partly because I'm a member of an academic association um, that used to be devoted to the study of the work of uh, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D.'s co-creator, Joss Whedon, uh, who's a writer director probably best known for Buffy the Vampire Slayer um, although the organization has recently rebranded uh, following revelations about Whedon's abusive behavior um, towards his wife and colleagues. So at the time I was looking for a topic to talk about at the Whedon Studies Association uh, as we were then called a uh, conference uh, and I was interested in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. because uh, it's set in a fictional um, American intelligence and security agency, uh, the eponymous uh, Strategic Homeland Intervention Enforcement and Logistics Division. Um, so it kind of tied in with my general research interests. Perhaps not surprisingly, given its setting and the historical moment at which it appeared, uh, the series has a strong preoccupation with the theme of violent radicalization. Um, the writers seem very interested in exploring how and why people are drawn into violent organizations, whether legal or illegal. And actually, this is a theme that we find elsewhere in the MCU as well. Um, for instance, there are two, two important characters in the films, uh, Natasha Black Widow Romanoff and James uh, Bucky Barnes, aka the Winter Soldier, um, were both brainwashed as part of secret Soviet programs um, to turn them into elite assassins. In Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., uh, the theme of violent radicalization is most clearly visible in the parallel narratives of two of the main characters, uh, Daisy Johnson and Grant Ward, um, which unfold during the first three seasons. Uh, and what I discovered when I studied these characters and their narratives more closely uh, is that they reproduced uh, a lot of the same cliches about violent radicalization um, that are commonly found in nonfiction media, such as news, uh, in political rhetoric, and even in some academic discourse on the subject. Uh, and in particular, I noticed that uh, in all these spheres uh, and in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., the way that radicalized women and their motivations are portrayed uh, is quite different from the portrayal of radicalized men. That said, uh, Daisy and Ward do have some things in common, uh, despite the fact that she is one of the heroes of the show and he is one of the main antagonists. Uh, so from young adulthood onwards, uh, both of them were drawn into a series of groups, none of which are straightforwardly good, some of which are downright evil. Um, in Daisy's case, this includes a collective of hacktivists, uh, S.H.I.E.L.D., 
and uh, a community of inhumans um, who in the MCU are humans with superpowers, uh, of which Daisy is one. In Ward's case, uh, he joins both S.H.I.E.L.D. Uh, and a terrorist organization hidden within it, uh, Hydra. The narrative explanations that we get for these characters' propensity to be drawn into such groups, uh, which are explicitly stated by Daisy and Ward, um, correspond with some commonly held beliefs about why people in general of both genders uh, get involved in terrorism. I looked at uh, government reports and news articles uh, from around the world, uh, so Kenya, Nigeria, Canada, the UK, the US, Belgium and Australia, um, all about the causes of violent radicalization. And I found some extremely recurrent ideas. The words broken and dysfunctional paired with either home or family uh, come up again and again. In particular, uh, children who were not brought up by their biological parents or who had absent fathers uh, are seen as especially vulnerable, um, as are those who experienced a normalization of violence in childhood. Um, these factors are believed to deprive people of a sense of belonging um, and therefore give them a need uh, to join a group that offers a sense of being welcomed, supported and looked after, um, to quote an Australian government stakeholder. In other words, as Matthew Levitt, uh, director of the Jeanette and Eli Reinhard program on counterterrorism and intelligence puts it, uh, recruiters offer a sense of family to people from broken homes. Now, it's important to note at this point that there are numerous scholars uh, and some journalists who contest the simplicity of this narrative. Um, certainly, there is plenty of evidence that shows um, that people who have adverse childhood experiences are significantly more likely to be involved in crime and or violence uh, as an adult, which may include terrorism. However, an increasing number of scholars studying violent radicalization argue that its causes are in fact uh, diverse, complex, uh, and may include both push factors, such as a violent upbringing, uh, and pull factors. For example, uh, in the case of ISIL, uh, reports of brutality by the Syrian government against its people. However, in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., uh, these two main radicalized characters, Daisy and Ward, um, do fit the stereotypes just mentioned. Um, Daisy was not brought up by her parents. Uh, she was separated from them as a baby and grew up in an orphanage and a series of unhappy foster homes. Um, Ward, on the other hand, experienced normalization of violence in childhood. Um, he had a dad with some real anger issues in the word of his, words of his brother and a mom with dad issues, uh, both of whom took these issues out on their sons. Meanwhile, Ward's older brother forced him to beat up their younger brother uh, and on one occasion throw him into a well. Uh, indeed, we might say that the well incident, uh, which is revealed in an episode suggestively entitled The Things We Bury, um, functions as an emblem of all of Ward's repressed, as if at the bottom of a well, childhood trauma uh, and its role in turning him bad. Um, Ward eventually ended up in a juvenile detention center after he tried to burn down the family home. Uh, and it was there he was recruited by John Garrett, um, a Hydra agent working undercover within S.H.I.E.L.D. In short, both Daisy and Ward had messed up childhoods, as Daisy puts it. Uh, and it's underlined repeatedly in dialogue um, that this gave each of them a strong desire to find replacement families. Um, for instance, Daisy remarks about Ward, after years of moving from place to place, I totally get how easy it was for him to be taken in by a powerful father figure. While Ward found his replacement family in Hydra, um, Daisy found hers in S.H.I.E.L.D. with its director Phil Coulson and his right-hand woman Melinda May uh, functioning as de facto parents. The fact that Daisy sees Coulson and May as surrogate parents is most clearly illustrated in a dream or rather nightmare sequence in the episode uh, Ye Who Enter Here, a sequence that also implies 
that Daisy still tormented about her apparent abandonment by her real parents, um, as well as by worries that she will turn out like them. Um, so hopefully I can show you a clip. Sacrifices have to be made. Poison tree, poison fruit. I know. Bye bye, Josh. So just to break down that sequence a little, um, Daisy, Coulson and May are dressed very differently from their usual dark colored utilitarian clothing. Um, Daisy's dressed rather like a little girl in a short flowery dress, while Coulson and May's outfits, suge outfits suggest a stereotypical middle class couple, uh, all of which perhaps indicates Daisy's wish that she had a normal upbringing. Um, on the soundtrack, a music box plays a lullaby version of the song uh, Daisy Bell, Bicycle Built for Two. This foreshadows the following episode in which Daisy meets her real father, Calvin Cal Zabo, for the first time. Uh, and he reveals that her name is Daisy. Up until that point, she had been known as Sky, And he hums the same tune. Uh, thus making it clear that the baby in the nightmare represents Daisy herself. Uh, as you heard, the dream Coulson and May uh, have a brief dialogue about how a poison tree produces poison fruit, um, which presumably implies that Daisy will grow up to resemble Cal, um, whom she's come to believe is a monster, uh, before putting the baby down uh, and walking away as the adult Daisy helplessly sh shouts, no, wait, wait, don't leave her. As this scene implies, uh, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D.'s narrative does not suggest that um, Daisy Ford forged an allegiance to S.H.I.E.L.D. Uh, and Ward to Hydra because she's an intrinsically better person than him, um, but rather that they formed their, their respective allegiances somewhat at random due to developing personal attachments to specific people. Uh, in Ward's case, Garrett, uh, and in Daisy's, uh, Colson and his team. Indeed, at one point, Ward explicitly states that he, quote, chose Hydra for petty personal selfish reasons for a father figure, and that he is not a true believer in their ideology. The way that uh, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. ascribes these characters' allegiances to personal attachments formed it's strongly suggested largely to try to compensate for childhood trauma uh, and neglect, mirrors the use of the broken home narrative uh, as an explanation for radicalization in the real world. In both cases, the effect is to remove uh, ideology or political conviction from the equation uh, and thus somewhat deny the agency of the radicalized person. However, as we're going to see, there are many further ways in which the mainstream discourse surrounding radicalization um, denies women's agency in particular. Before I lay out the most common stereotypes of radicalized women uh, and examine Daisy's narrative in light of them, I'm first going to talk a bit about Ward's trajectory as a point of comparison. So as I first mentioned, he was recruited uh, into Hydra within S.H.I.E.L.D., uh, at a young age by John Garrett. Uh, at the beginning of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., he's part of Coulson's team um, before his true allegiance is revealed towards the end of the first season. However, Garrett is killed soon after that. Ward initially tries to re-ingratiate himself with Walt Coulson's team, uh, drawing on the broken home narrative as an excuse for his co-option into Hydra. Uh, my parents and brother left me vulnerable, he says. Uh, but unsurprisingly, given his murder and attempted murder of several S.H.I.E.L.D. agents, this strategy fails. Um, so Ward sets up his own team instead, uh, resurrecting the all but destroyed Hydra and turning it into a kind of evil S.H.I.E.L.D. Um, with himself as the director. 
The most powerful remaining head of the old Hydra, Gideon Malik, gets wind of uh, Ward's activities and tries to have him killed. However, Ward single-handedly overpowers the five or more men uh, sent to assassinate him, impressing Malik so much that he offers him the uh, position of Hydra's second head. Ward is finally murdered by Coulson soon afterwards, um, but his story doesn't end there because his body and memories are possessed by an ancient evil inhuman called Hive. Hive is a creature whom the uh, senior members of Hydra uh, always intended to become their leader, and he soon start, starts plotting to take over the world, having Malik killed along the way. Um, and... No, no. So, um, uh, just got a couple of very quick uh, clips here that I think kind of give a good indication of uh, Hive's supreme power uh, in these kind of low angle, slow motion shots uh, of him striding down corridors. Um, just to clarify, Hive is not actually the same person as Ward. Um, he's absorbed the memories of many other people too. Um, however, he has Ward's body uh, and seems to feel uh, an affinity with the man, uh, describing him in the episode The Inside Man, a title which perhaps alludes to Ward's presence inside Hive uh, as the perfect host. Thus, I think it is fair to say that uh, Hive is in some ways a continuation of the character of Ward uh, and therefore continues Ward's trajectory of gradually gaining independence and power. While Ward transforms from a slavish follower into an ever more powerful leader, uh, Daisy, on the other hand, remains a follower uh, and nearly always of a man. But before I talk more about her narrative, uh, let's take a quick look at the way uh, that female terrorists have typically been portrayed in uh, academic media and governmental discourses. As Cindy Banks observes, until fairly recently, women were written out of terrorism studies altogether uh, due to a widespread assumption that terrorists have always been male. Since female terrorists have started to be taken into account by scholars in roughly the last two decades, uh, a key point of focus has always been their motivations. As Banks explains, the motivations of male terrorists are examined far less often um, because, quote, it has been assumed that they are dedicated to a cause uh, and prepared to use violence to achieve their goals. Uh, women, on the other hand, are traditionally viewed as the victims of violence and not as its perpetrators. Uh, and therefore, when they do commit violence, it is characterized as aberrant, personally motivated uh, and beyond the agency of the perpetrator. In recent years, more nuanced academic work on the subject has appeared um, with various empirical studies revealing that, in fact, women's reasons for joining the violent struggles of non-state groups are equally as complex and multifaceted as men's, obviously. Uh, for instance, in the conclusion to their study of the social media activity of uh, 17 Western women who joined ISIL between uh, 2011 and 2015, uh, Meredith Loken and Anna Zelens write, Uh, our data makes clear that Daesh, that is ISIL women, like most participants in political violence, perform both agent and agentively and otherwise. These recruits are pushed and pulled by external forces of violence, religion and community. The political implications of our findings are clear. Disparate treatment of male and female foreign recruits is misguided. Uh, nevertheless, recent studies of the media and governmental discourse surrounding radicalized women show that there's still a strong tendency uh, for them to be portrayed in these spheres as um, passive victims who were manipulated or forced by men uh, into joining terrorist organizations. 
For instance, after conducting discourse analysis of the depiction of the Bethnal Green school girls in British uh, newspapers, uh, Sarah Shaban concluded that, quote, the primary narrative of fear found throughout the coverage focused on the victimization of the three London girls, uh, specifically portraying them as victims of sexual abuse, uh, i.e. they're having been groomed on social media by ISIL recruiters um, who convinced them to become so-called jihadi brides. Running parallel to and sometimes overlapping with the tendency to frame radicalized women as victims uh, is an equally strong tendency to represent them as deviant. Uh, the types of deviants ascribed to them vary somewhat according to factors such as religion and ethnicity. Uh, for instance, VG Julie Rajan contrasts uh, sexualized depictions of uh, Muslim women suicide bombers as fetishized femme fatale, um, with those of white women suicide bombers as, quote, uh, prostitutes who sell their bodies to satisfy their own deviant sexual desires for the other male. However, um, all of the stereotypes of deviant women engaged in prescribed political violence um, found in media, academic and political discourse can be sorted into three basic and again, often overlapping types of narrative, uh, which Laura Sjoberg and Karen E. Gentry have labeled mothers, monsters, and whores, uh, and which they summarize like this. Um, the mother narratives describe women's violence as a need to nurture and a way of taking care of and being loyal to men, motherhood gone awry. The monster narratives describe violent women as insane, in denial of their femininity, no longer women or human. Uh, the whore narratives focused on women's erotomania describe violent women's sexuality as both extreme and brutal. Um, so now we're gonna see how these various kinds of stereotypes of victims, mother, monster, and whore um, crop up in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Uh, in relation to Daisy, uh, and also another character, Daisy's real mother, Jai Ying. So as I mentioned, throughout Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D.'s narrative, Daisy remains a follower. And furthermore, her, vo her follower status is often bound up with a sense of victimhood. Um, first, she's the follower of her hacktivist mentor and boyfriend, uh, who later betrays their shared ideals um, by selling information. Then she becomes a follower of Coulson, who initially kidnaps her before she reluctantly agrees to join forces with his team uh, and eventually becomes an agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. And then in season three, uh, as I will discuss further in a minute, um, she becomes a follower of Hive, uh, who has the power to control other inhumans. However, before that, uh, Daisy briefly becomes the follower of a woman, her mother Jai Ying, uh, who is the leader of a community of inhumans called Afterlife. Afterlife is immediately established as, uh, in every respect, a contrast to S.H.I.E.L.D. So S.H.I.E.L.D. is a largely male-run, militarized environment, uh, heavily reliant on science and technology, um, whose dingy bases are dominated by muted gray and blue shades. Afterlife, on the other hand, is a visually attractive, although highly orientalized um, village-like environment uh, situated in a secret location in the mountains, uh, possibly in China, since uh, Jiang is Chinese, um, where the dominant colors are bright reds and greens. At first, Jiang herself appears to be a benevolent maternal figure. Um, who gently ushers her followers through the difficult process of pterogenesis, uh, which is when their inhuman genes are activated uh, and they acquire superpowers. Whereas Daisy's shield colleagues are terrified when she undergoes pterogenesis and place her in quarantine, uh, Jai Ying patiently teaches her to control her superpower, um, which is the ability to cause uh, mini earthquakes. Daisy is thrilled with her own progress and with afterlife in general. Um, she tells Jai Ying it feels like home and she seems almost ready uh, to abandon S.H.I.E.L.D., her previous surrogate family, um, which she incorrectly believes has turned against her. 
However, this ostensible matri uh, matriarchal utopia does not last for long, as Jiaying is soon revealed to be a male malevolent mother uh, in two of the ways described by Sjöberg and Gentry. Um, firstly, she's a woman who's out to avenge uh, uh, a destroyed happy home. Uh, so in the late 80s, uh, she was living happily in her home village in China uh, with her American husband, Cal, and baby Daisy, uh, when she was kidnapped by members of Hydra posing as shield agents and was subjected to cruel experiments uh, because of her inhuman powers, uh, which are the ability to heal herself of any injury and to remain eternally youthful. She was cut into pieces and only survived because Cal found her remains and stitched them back together, uh, allowing her powers to take effect. However, when they returned to their village, uh, the couple found that Daisy had been abducted by S.H.I.E.L.D. They massacred the entire team of S.H.I.E.L.D. agents and all the villagers as well, um, but the baby was retrieved by a second S.H.I.E.L.D. team uh, and taken to the U.S. These experiences left Jiaying with an extremely hostile attitude towards humans in general uh, and S.H.I.E.L.D. in particular. Her ultimate aim is eventually revealed to be to lead the inhabitants of afterlife into a war against S.H.I.E.L.D. and then to start an inhuman revolution against humanity. Thus, her position at afterlife also aligns Jiaying uh, with the second kind of mother described by Sjöberg and Gentry, the nurturing mother who looks after a group of combatants. As Catherine E. Brown uh, suggests, this second image of radicalized women as the nurturers uh, and encouragers of fighters uh, is, in the UK at least, the dominant way that they feature in contemporary counterterrorism policy. Um, the paradoxicality of the fact that the supposed role of such mothers is not only to take care of their surrogate children, um, but also to act as inspirational examples who encourage them to fight and perhaps be killed is suggested by the predatory way that Jiaying's superpower works. She's only able to remain young and to heal herself by absorbing the life force from others, killing them in the process. Both Jiaying's sinister superpower and her dark backstory mark her out not only as a mother, but also as a monster, uh, and in fact, she's often referred to as such within the show, a woman who is pathologically damaged and therefore drawn to violence, as Sjöberg and Gentry put it. According to Cal, his wife had a good heart until it was both figuratively and literally uh, torn out by Hydra and she became out for blood. As I just explained, she was cut into pieces and then reassembled by Cal like Frankenstein's creature, um, which is an especially apposite comparison since Cal is a doctor uh, and after the abductions of his wife and daughter, an increasingly mad one. Subsequently, Jiaying's uh, inner monstrosity is visually signaled uh, in a hackneyed and ableist trope by the scars on her face. The ethnically other and monstrous mother, uh, Jiaying, is ultimately vanquished by a coalition of white American fathers. Coulson's team defeat her in human fighters, and Cal reluctantly kills Jia Ying, thereby redeeming himself and allowing Daisy to return to S.H.I.E.L.D. In season three, then, Daisy is swayed by Hive, uh, which means instantly brainwashed. And it is during this Hive storyline that Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D.'s resonances with contemporary discourse about violent radicalization arguably become the most pronounced. Uh, in fact, it's even possible to draw certain connections between Hive and ISIL. Just as the groups which eventually became ISIL uh, were initially supported by the West, Hive is supported by Malik, a rich and uh, politically influential industrialist um, who can surely be seen as a symbol of the Western corporate uh, political establishment, against whom Hive later turns. Furthermore, while ISIL is noted for its unprecedented use of various kinds of media to publicize its cause and instill fear in its enemies, Hive likewise seems to have a kind of symbiotic relationship with the media and information. As he grows in strength, his lair gradually fills with an increasing number of television screens, uh, apparently showing news footage, uh, which he stares fixedly, 
stopping only to leaf through one of the many books which he likewise uh, gradually acquires. He also grows in strength by assimilating further bodies in a variety of ways. Um, he converts some people to his cause, either by possessing them as he does with Ward, um, or in the case of inhumans, swaying them, uh, and he kills many others. Hive's ultimate goal is to convert all humans by transforming them into swayed inhumans, thus turning the world into his own inhuman empire, or to use the language of ISIL caliphate. While the specific similarities between Hive and ISIL are probably coincidental, he and his converts can certainly be described as a terrorist group. When Daisy is swayed by Hive and as a result commits violence against her closest friends and colleagues, she becomes not only a victim again, but in Sjöberg and Gentry's terms, a whore. According to Sjöberg and Gentry, there are three different kinds of whore narrative, but the one that most applicable, that's most applicable to uh, Daisy and Hive is what they call sexual slavery. Uh, a type of narrative which describes men as the owners and controllers of women's bodies, physically and emotionally choosing their violence for them. Commonly cited real life examples include media depictions of the Bethnal Green trio and other so-called jihadi brides and of Chechen female suicide bombers, uh, so-called black widows, who are often portrayed by the media as having been drugged, brainwashed, or otherwise forced into their actions by Chechen men. In Daisy's case, Hive sway causes a biological reaction that gives her an overwhelming desire to do his bidding. So great is her devotion to him that like a suicide bomber, um, she's willing to give up her life to his cause. Hive and Daisy's relationships not overtly portrayed as romantic or sexual, uh, that would probably be considered too dark for network television. Um, however, it does carry those connotations um, through the fact that Daisy and Ward were briefly romantically linked in season one, um, as well as through the way the sway works. Like love, it floods the brain with dopamine, making the subject uh, feel extremely happy. And there are also some creepy moments uh, such as when Daisy puts her head on Hive's shoulder, or when he refers uh, to some primitive inhumans he has created using her blood as our children. Predictably, Daisy is eventually uh, rescued from Hive's clutches by S.H.I.E.L.D. Uh, in a plan orchestrated by her boyfriend Lincoln, um, who sends an inhuman with the power to de-sway other inhumans um, to Hive's lair. This denouement re reproduces the common assumption uh, that radicalized women are victims in need of rescue by Western institutions. Um, furthermore, since this assumption is particularly commonly made about non-Western women, um, it's worth noting that Lincoln is white, whereas Daisy's half Chinese. The way I've described it so far uh, makes it sound as if the show is really black and white in its portrayal of S.H.I.E.L.D. as this unimpeachable team of all American heroes um, that repeatedly save a non-white woman, Daisy, perpetual victim, um, from various othered terrorists, such as Chinese Jiaying uh, and literally alien Hive. Um, to be fair to the writers, this is not entirely the case. I don't have time to go into this properly now, uh, but the show continually quite explicitly draws parallels between Hive and S.H.I.E.L.D. Um, for instance, Hive says to Coulson, we're two sides of the same coin, uh, commanders leading soldiers. And then later, Coulson insists that Lincoln wears a kind of suicide vest to confront Hive. Uh, and when May angrily reacts to this, Colson admits, on one level, I'm no better than Hive. Um, and beyond the parallels between S.H.I.E.L.D. and Hive, there's obviously a, a, an even more damning indictment of S.H.I.E.L.D. Uh, as an institution in the fact that there was a terrorist organization hidden within it since its creation. In fact, I found this kind of ambiguity to be fairly common uh, in post 9-11 sci-fi TV. Um, not only is there a blurring of the lines between villainy and heroism, um, but there's an implication that terrorism is not in fact a threat posed to Western society by 
sinister outsiders, um, but rather a phenomenon that has sprung out of and remains deeply intermeshed with uh, the Western military industrial complex. However, this ambiguity clearly does not absolve agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. from this tendency that I've been discussing to reproduce pernicious stereotypes about the supposed motivations and attributes of people, especially women involved in terrorism, portraying them as the products of broken homes, uh, or in the case of women, as victims, mothers, monsters, or whores. In the real world, a growing number of academic studies are appearing that show that not only are women's reasons for becoming involved in non-state armed groups just as multidimensional as men's, uh, but women are increasingly likely to hold leadership positions within those groups. Nonetheless, uh, media and even governmental discourse still often falls back on sensationalized rhetoric and a hodgepodge of the sexist and often racist stereotypes I've been discussing. For instance, coming back to Shamima Begum, at the time of her departure for Syria, she was mostly portrayed as an impressionable victim of internet grooming. Then, more recently, once she started trying to come back to the UK, she became bloodthirsty and fanatical, according to the British newspaper, The Times, and a bitter, twisted character with deep psychological problems, uh, according to The Sun. In other words, a monster. Uh, we even get shades of the whore stereotype in an opinion piece in The Telegraph, um, which draws attention to Begum's physical appearance during a TV interview, her long, sleek hair, cool clothes, and polished manicure, uh, as reasons why we shouldn't feel sorry for her. Uh, in the last month, there's actually been a further development in the Begum case, um, which is that it's been revealed that she was smuggled into Syria uh, by a man who was working as an intelligence agent uh, for Canada. So it's now quite clear that she was a victim of trafficking, um, which is something that the then British Home Secretary uh, Sajid Javid denied when he stripped her of her citizenship a few years ago. Um, It'll be interesting to see how this revelation affects the media discourse about her. I've already seen one uh, very recent opinion piece in The Telegraph, uh, which is more sympathetic, although it's also quite patronizing, um, referring to Begum and her foolish young friends. Uh, the journal where I'm publishing this article have asked me if I want to write a blog article for their website uh, on a related theme uh, to help publicize my article. And I'm thinking of doing something specifically about um, media representations of uh, Shamima Begum. She features prominently in a, a documentary from last year called The Return, Life After ISIS, uh, which I just watched last weekend, and I actually thought it was pretty good. It's quite sensitive and balanced. Um, and then it's just been announced that there's going to be a BBC documentary and podcast about her as well. So it might be interesting to compare these various portrayals. So... I better wrap up. Uh, the way I finished the article is just to reiterate that whether they're portrayed as innocent victims or malicious deviants, um, radicalized women are routinely stripped of their agency by media representations, both factual and fictional. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eve. Um, that was absolutely fascinating. Um, it's always um, compelling to hear how, you know, this media contents that we consume for pleasure and uh, usually quite uncritically actually reproduce uh, so many um, stereotypes and problematic ideological messages, um, um, somehow um, placing all the weight of criminality onto the individual and his deviant past and uh, not questioning the, the social structures. Um, so I'm, I'm not a big consumer of uh, science fiction myself, but I was wondering if uh, there would be any sort of counter examples where, for instance, perhaps the, the role of US, you know, in destabilizing uh, other regions uh, or, you know, perhaps even suggesting their weight of responsibility in occurrence of terrorist groups around the world would be somehow put forth 
it's perhaps a naive question, but yeah. Well, I think the thing about a lot of sci-fi and kind of why I like it, uh, I mean, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. is like, it's an interesting example because it's sort of at the crossroads of genre of like, yes, it is quite sci-fi, you know, it has aliens and space travel and everything, but obviously it's also kind of, you know, it is set largely in the real world in the present day and you know in so it's sort of in between sci-fi and kind of like well what we'd call spy-fi maybe like um so it's it's a bit more literal about these things than a lot of sci-fi and what I generally like about sci-fi in general is that um it often approaches these issues in more of a, a kind of metaphorical way um, you know, and that allows it to actually be a lot more critical uh, about sort of current events and current, you know, um, actions of governments than something set in the real world. Um, so, you know, well, a, a sort of very famous example is um, Battlestar Galactica, which I talk a lot about in my uh, in my book slash thesis. Um, and that was that came out, you know, when the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan were still raging. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it has a whole storyline where like, um, you know, the, the, there's like an occupation and, um, and, and there's things like um, the supposed goodies are sort of torturing the, the supposed baddies uh, in, you know, this very sort of Abu Ghraib like uh, uh, kind of scenario. Um, and so it's like, it's very blatantly criticizing um, what was what was going on at the time but because it's you know set thousands of years in the future in space they could kind of get away with it um more than something in the real world whereas i think you know something like agents of shield it's a bit more like i said it's kind of ambiguous ambiguous about where it lies and our shield the goodies of the baddies which, which makes it kind of interesting to study um I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, sorry, I just, uh, I had to put my camera on. We lost Alenka. <laughs> hi, hello. Maybe, maybe I can uh, ask a question. Oh, or, hi. <laughs> uh, hi. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me well? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, thank you. Thanks a lot for uh, for the talk. Very very interesting. Also because I'm uh, I, I'm quite a fan. Unlike Alenka, I'm quite a fan of science of science fiction uh, <laughs> uh, series. And still, I ha I haven't seen this. I, I maybe I should. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, well, I'm um, of course you you you, you focused on. Um, sorry, let me present myself. I'm I'm also a member of the of the Center of the Advanced Studies. My name is Gabriel Serbu, and I'm I'm. Um, yeah, a member of this uh, in Rijeka, this uh, Center of the Advanced Studies. Uh, so I, I was um, wondering. I mean, of course, you focused mainly on uh, on the different port uh, on the um, gender based uh, uh, on on this discrimination in the way uh, women and uh, men are portrayed as um, as, uh, as as radicalized subjects, right? Uh, and very clear and very, <laughs> very enlightening. Uh, uh, but you also um, you also focused a lot at the, at the beginning uh, on on this uh, stereotype of the broken family uh, and how it's many many times it's um, um, how can I say it it is uh, maybe the main or or it's always there right is like one of the main reasons uh, for which. Uh, um, uh, uh violent radicalization happens right uh and i this is not really a question i mean it's a question but it's just uh, i was when i when you when you were talking about this i was just thinking about how um the message of the how how strong is today from from the right um right wing side of politics the message of of, of family and uh and and how important the family values and especially the of course, the the, the traditional uh, heterosexual um, uh, family. So I'm I was wondering if um, uh, yeah, if we can also make maybe uh, make a, a connection between uh, how how um, how these 
ideological, um, uh, let's say, um, motives just sneak in also in this in, in, in apparently uh, innocent uh, series such as such as this one. And uh, uh, so because you focus so much on the family, I was wondering, is there maybe uh, um, maybe some other like um, like uh, uh, stereotypes such as the family, like maybe I was thinking maybe of, um, I don't know, like um, um, uh, some kind of feeling of vengeance against your own country, like you feel like your country has betrayed you, so you want to, uh, so violent radicalization maybe happens also because of that, or maybe uh, some religious based, uh, um, like a kind of, um, why, why, do I, why, why do I say religion and why do I mention religion and, and, uh, and the country? Because I'm, I was thinking of the, uh, I was uh, thinking of uh, the recent, uh, the unfortunate recent elections in Italy. And as you might know, one of the, uh, Giorgia Meloni's, um, um, how can I say, um, um, banner was, uh, God, family, and country. So, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I was just wondering if maybe uh, it's it is quite common to think that from a right wing perspective, anyone who, who uh, maybe doesn't have a very good relationship with uh, God, uh, heterosexual family, and 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 Christian God, of course, and and uh, uh, his or her own country, is a potential victim of violent radicalization. Or I'm just. You know, I'm just thinking. Sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I'm, I'm not uh, like I'm obviously a media studies person, so it's not yeah. completely my field. But um, for sure, just from what I've seen, like absolutely. I mean, if you look at the Shamima Begum case, like with the stripping her of her, you know, this is someone who was born in the UK, had like never left the UK before, um, but very much the freight. But her parents were uh, from Bangladesh. Um, and so the framing it of it was very much like, oh, she's not really British, you know, she's right. um, she should go and get uh, Bangladeshi citizenship. Right. Even, I saw an interview with like the, the like Bangladeshi um, foreign minister or whoever, and he was like, he was like, why would we give her nationality? Like, you know, she's never <laughs> been to Bangladesh. Like, um, right. so yeah, I mean, obviously there is that kind of. I just think purely racist thing of like yeah you're not really um from this country which obviously does get yeah. a bit more complicated because actually not all of these um like the jihadi brides for example there are some uh some you know ethnically white ones um who converted and what have you so in that case it gets a bit more complicated but yeah for sure there's this sense of you're not really whatever nationality you are um, and yes, religion as well, for sure. Like so often I feel like the, um, the, 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 the media calls for the onus to be on, um, well, A, the family, but B, also the kind of, you know, there's this sense of, oh, the religious leaders are not doing enough to, you know, to stop the imams are not doing enough to tell this you know um people that this is not the right path and what have you um so yeah i mean and again this is islamophobic racist because we you know we never hear these things when it's kind of a you know when when a, a white christian quote unquote um person you know commits terrorism you never get these kind of, uh, of, of blaming of the the religion or um Thank you so much. <laughs> um, are there any other questions or comments? I would just like to thank you very much for the for a great talk. I mean, there is sort of ton of things that I might between sort of I, it's a very very sort of interesting subject and I think that sort of this strange it's not a question as such it's just a sort of short comment about this 
sort of Marvel universe and how it tries to to sort of accommodate this ambiguity between the sort of good and the bad and uh, radicalization and what is not the radicalization, but it's actually a sort of good radicalization, so to speak, is really sort of interesting. I think it sort of, sort of has a lot of both sort of po posit semi-positive and both sort of very sort of strange problematic moments. I mean, sure. as I said, it's not, a, it's not a question, but I really no, find No, 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 but that's absolutely, I mean, that's something like, a, obviously, like a lot of, uh, of critics have observed about, uh, you know, sort of these big blockbuster superhero films is sort of how ideologically incoherent they are. Um, David Bordwell, uh, the, you know, great um, film critic, he, he says that they, they do it strategically. Um, because they obviously they want to attract the biggest possible audience and they don't want to alienate everybody so they kind of throw in these references like sort of veiled references to kind of contemporary uh, politics and in, in kind of a way that allows you to interpret them how you want um so yeah i think it it could be intentional <laughs> I do talk a bit more about this in the the full article. Um, um, well, I guess if there are no other questions, um, I will thank you again, Eve. Um, You're welcome. Pleasure. <laughs> thank, thank you for you having much. me. <laughs> and I will definitely thank watch you. it <laughs> after this. Okay, great. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yves. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. Have a good day. And uh, see you all, yes, next uh, Thursday, our usual time at noon. So take care. Have a lovely Bye. day. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.